Welcome to the CX Green Room. I'm Ginger Conlon, Thought Leadership Director at Genesis. Let us know who you are and where you're joining us from in the comments. So here is today's CX environment. Switching brands is easier than ever. Social media fans, fads rather, are driving all kinds of brand experimentation and switching. Consumers have outsized expectations. And all of this has led to some capricious customer behavior, making loyalty harder won and harder kept than ever before. At the same time, CX leaders are challenged not only by this, but also by continuous tech innovation and market pressures. Well, today we have uh, customer experience futurist Blake Morgan with us today. Welcome, Blake. Ginger, it is so good to see you. We were just chatting. I've known you for literally like 17 years. It's amazing. So excited. We're both still in the game. And I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we are going to talk about Blake's advice for how to put customers first in this cra crazy environment that I just mentioned. So, of course, Blake is going to draw from her years of experience that she just mentioned, but also from her amazing new book that you can't see because I have the crazy backgrounds, um, but it is called The Eight Laws of Customer Focused Leadership. And I've been reading it and I've been dog earing it and marking it up. So I highly recommend it. But we are going to talk about it a little bit today. And so um, if you have questions for Blake, of course, just go ahead and drop them in the comments. But in the meantime, first question for you, Blake, the easy one. Tell us about yourself and your focus on customer experience. Well, I started so long ago, almost 20 years ago. That's when I met you in New York. And I had the opportunity to basically start building out thought leadership on what we were calling CRM at the time. Fast forward almost 20 years later, I had the opportunity to do a customer service um, leadership role at Intel. I've worked at startups, but the most favorite thing that I do is bring thought leadership and travel all over the world to the far corners of the earth to help practitioners understand how they themselves can build this story of customer experience. That if you make people's lives easier and better, you will always have customers. I've just written my third book on the topic called The Eight Laws of Customer Focused Leadership. And I, I travel doing keynotes and I have a podcast called The Modern Customer. But I just find the customer experience space endlessly interesting. And I find that the people that do these roles, it, they have no shortage of challenges. So I love being in service to the practitioner that uses my frameworks, research, ideas, and stories. And they go back and bring it to their own companies to say, hey, hey, this is why customer experience is important. We have to invest in our customer relationships. And as the category has changed and evolved, I love having a front seat to help kind of etch out what it means, what it looks like, how we can think about it. And that that has translated into LinkedIn courses and as I mentioned books and all kinds of content. So, Yeah, so that's fantastic. So what was the inspiration for this book in particular, The Eight Laws? Yeah, I was in Dallas recently and I was giving a workshop to the leadership of a telecom provider and the telecom provider executives were asking me if I felt that that the front line could decide to be customer centric and just slowly be, create a customer centric culture. And my answer to the group was no, customer centricity has to be driven from the top. It has to be leadership that is driving the ship that is making decisions because, you know, your frontline and customer service can't just decide that they they want to block and tackle for the customer. It's resources. It's reducing back end complexity. It's language. It's innovation. And that's why I believe customer experience has to be done at the leadership level. There's a lot of books on customer experience. There's a lot of books on leadership, but there are almost no books for anybody to understand how they can individually become a customer focused leader. So the first law is to create a customer experience mindset. I love this. Now, to me, that sounds both foundational, but also challenging in an environment like you were just talking about that maybe it's not already part of an organization's culture. So what advice do you have for building that CX mindset? 
It really boils down to the manager. I talk a lot in the book about coaching. And before leaders can be coaches and engaging their teams, the leader must engage themselves. And I love the example of Jeff Bezos. Here's a guy that even from the beginning was misunderstood, but it didn't deter him. He would jump up out of bed in the morning, excited to serve the customer. He had to spend a lot of time convincing everyone around him that, that they should basically be patient, that if you invest in long-term customer experience programs, these things don't always bring an ROI right away. So he would tell his teams and, and write on the whiteboard at Amazon, I am not my stock price. And even the Wall Street Journal um, ran a cover story, Amazon.bomb. Forrester, the CEO of Forrester, called Amazon toast in the early 2000s. But Jeff Bezos always had a vision for what he was building. He knew that if he focused on adding value to the customer, that eventually he would build a really successful company. But it's this idea of being excited about the minutia, excited about the work in the contact center. I mean, it's hard work, Ginger. It's it's It can feel thankless. It's literally the place where all the problems in the organization sit. And this is very challenging work. Contact centers are often under-resourced. So that's why if we bring style and energy and excitement to the work that we do in the contact center, if we have customer experience mindset for ourselves, if as individuals we understand this idea of servant leadership, of having purpose and meaning in our lives with the way that we serve others, we will always have a community around us. We will always have customers. And only, and only when we coach ourselves – we understand mindset matters for the individual, that we rise to the occasion to be a leader and we can influence everyone around us. So customer experience mindset, I'm so glad you asked. That's my favorite piece of the CX framework that I have in the book. Yeah, I like how some people actually bring a physical chair into the room to represent the customer when they're having strategy meetings. That's just a simple token, you know? Absolutely. Um, even when I worked at a Fortune 100 company, at a at a tech company, the language, the jargon we used, no one would understand what we were talking about because it was just so insular. It was just this language because we were so product focused rather than being customer focused. We were so focused on how we did things and the language we used. And you find that when companies are customer focused and leaders are customer focused, they're very self-conscious about, well, what are the implications of this for the customer? How does this impact the person on the receiving end of the experience? Sometimes a customer is an employee. And so that's why one of the chapters in the book is about employee experience. Yeah, well, I'm going to ask you about that. But first, you, know, you mentioned about Jeff Bezos and having patience. Well, several of the laws in your book focus on developing and executing short-term and long-term CX strategy in tandem. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how important, it's so important to consider both from the outset, as you say, right? So mm -hmm. tell us more about that approach to strategy development. In the book, I actually reference David Cote, the former CEO of Honeywell. He wrote a book called Winning Now, Winning Later, where he talks about his strategy as a CEO to turn a company from 20 billion market cap to 120 billion over at Honeywell, which is a multinational conglomerate. And he basically, as CEO, just became very interested in the minutia of what was happening because he found there was a culture of gaming the system, of lying about metrics. If People that ran factories at Honeywell didn't think a customer issue was their fault. They would leave it out of the report and the data. And so he went on this journey to personally understand what was happening, to see it for himself. And that is why some of the most customer-focused CEOs that are able to look long-term long and short-term, they want to understand the implications of every move for both today and tomorrow. Because in my research, there's so many books written about how to be a good leader. And it seems like even companies like McKinsey, it's like the, the biggest hindering block to creating a customer-focused company is this inability to hold two opposing ideas in our mind at one time. So how do I take care of all the fires that need to 
put be put out today while also planting seeds for tomorrow. So how do I focus on taking care of everything for this quarter, but, but also figuring out what do we need to do for the business for growth in one year, two years, five years, 10 years. And if we can simply be like David Cody from Honeywell, who he knew everyone thought he would fail when he took over the reins of Honeywell. So he knew he had to turn around a quick profit to prove Wall Street wrong, but also plant seeds for the company for tomorrow. And he was very successful by just being interested in the minutia of the business. One of the things that you said about him in the book is how he went and collected customer feedback himself, but he right. thought it was important to, to talk to customers himself, which is, is of course, essential. And it reminds me of uh, years ago, I interviewed um, an ex uh, the head of marketing for Samsung US. He's, mm -hmm. he's since been at, at a different company, but um, Peter Reedfalls, he used to call the contact center so often that the manager of the contact center said, you have to call from different numbers because you know, you know it's you, right? And they had the, the dialer, right? So they would recognize mm -hmm. his number. So it's, he was trying to like secret shop, but it's like, we know it's you now, Peter, you have to be more creative. But he was, he was obsessed with that, gaining that firsthand understanding of what the customer was going through by not only interviewing customers, but also taking himself through that customer experience firsthand. That is such a great example, Ginger. That's so funny. Good for him for being so <laughs> obsessed with what's happening, um, being a mystery shopper that the contact center is like, all right, can you be a little more mysterious, mystery <laughs> shopper? Like, we know who you are. Come on. Yeah, it was a great story. So so speaking of the frontline employees, as you said earlier, um, you also recommend that CX leaders think of employees as customers and I, I agree with you. This is table stakes. So, you know, because customer experience basically will fall flat if you have low uh, employee morale. Right? So mm -hmm. what are some of the most effective ways to engage those frontline employees today? Yeah, one of the examples in the book comes from the former head of the contact center for Warby Parker, the D to C um, eyeglasses brand that disrupted the whole eyeglass industry. And I just love the way he really coached his teams. And it wasn't big things he did. It was little things like the way he managed sending onboarding kits to new remote contact center agents with a uniform, which was like maybe a fun bathrobe and slippers that are working from home. Um, or, you know, the way that he would give negative feedback. He never wanted to bring contact center agents into his office to give negative feedback because he didn't want employees to feel like they were going to the principal's office. So he'd take them for lunch or he'd just make sure they weren't just sitting there feeling like they're in trouble. Um, he would get some of the higher performing agents to coach the other agents. So giving opportunities for leadership to some of the employees and even just giving like lanyards or badges for employees that had achieved a certain amount of time with the company and success, doing fun call outs on the internal intranet and social network for birthdays, signage all over the office lunches. I mean, this is not tough stuff. This is just caring. I also in the book talk about Trader Joe's and why no one has been able to disrupt this amazing grocery store Trader Joe's. The founder knew from the beginning if he would just pay fair wages to employees. Um, he offers medical, dental. He does skip level meetings. So employees are often interviewed by their boss's boss. I mean, these are just, this is just a human way to run a business. So whether in the book I talk about Warby Parker or Trader Joe's and their employee experience and how they know their people are their greatest asset, um, these are companies that understand it's not necessarily the big sweeping changes. It's the little things about how to be a great manager and a great coach. Yeah, absolutely. Taking care of your employees. Um can start with the, the smallest things, like you said, and then you know weaving in some technology to support them, of course. There's so many ways to do it today just to make, th these employees are core to the customer experience. And so if you're not taking care of them, then you're just leaving your customer experience to chance. Um, and yeah. you, know, you can't do it, like you said, 
Customer experience is a decision that you make every day. Yes. It's a decision you make every day. Many employees are disengaged and you can feel it. Like I have never experienced the experience I have at Trader Joe's at any other grocery store because they operationalize employee and customer experience. And you will not ever check out of a Trader Joe's without being asked something nice. Like, hey, you have any fun plans for the weekend? Or, oh, you like this spice, this um, ranch flavored spice? Like, how do you use this when you cook? And they, they are told to make small talk with you. And it, it is nice because so many grocery stores now, they're just trying to cut costs. Self-checkout mm -hmm. is prevalent. And it's just not a very human experience. You do everything yourself. And Trader Joe's, they know that that human interaction, some people, that's the only human interaction they're going to have in their entire day. And so they know that people make other people happy. Happy employees make happy customers. And that is just such a big part of the in-store Trader Joe's experience. And they don't have delivery or an app or really a website. It's all about that human experience when you go to the store. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice for the employee too, instead of just like, I'm ringing things up and I'm in this like robot mode, you know, to actually yeah. like have those human interactions. Yeah. You can tell they're happy. I mean, they're free to make small talk with one another and you hear, you can just hear them chirping and they just sound happy. I mean, you could tell when an employee is happy or not. I mean, how many times Ginger, have you had the experience where someone's serving you in some capacity and you're a customer and as a customer, you feel like bad because the employee looks so miserable or seems so unhappy. You almost feel bad that you're like interrupting them. That's not a yeah. great experience. No. And you're right. You do feel bad for the environment that they're working in, that they are having like a bad day at work, you know? So, um, no surprise. One of your laws of customer centric, uh, leadership is to measure what matters. And it, it seems like these days it's getting even harder to do that, right? Because you've got technologies like AI coming in and changing the game. So for example, if AI is handling more rote interactions in the contact center, that means that agents are handling the more complex interactions, which of course means that handle time is going to increase. Now, of course, that may also lower your service costs because of all the, the uh, interactions being deferred to AI, but it's something that you need to think about or you might be measuring the wrong thing. So what's your take on all this? Yeah, I actually had a fascinating, fascinating conversation with, with um, Moran de Bouge. We were just talking about him, the general manager at Genesis, and he was saying how what AI has done in some scenarios in the contact center is take agents, take away their fake break. Because I did a change management course on AI in the contact center for LinkedIn. And that in my research with some of your teammates was what came up, which was the agents are rejecting the AI. They say, we don't like this technology. But what they're actually rejecting is that the AI has taken away things like the notes write up that they would normally do. Agents would normally get a two minute break to do a write up of each call summary. And now the AI does it. So the agents are going from call to call with no break. So that's why change management, it really is important as we bring in these new AI technologies into the contact center that we don't get so obsessed with metrics that we're really looking at the human experience that we treat our agents like people that we're not obsessed with butts and seats and average handle time, which you and I have been talking about for 20 years, that we're actually looking at what kind of outcome are we driving? What kind of culture do we have here in the contact center? Because the contact center, if you think about it, everybody, it's literally the place where you have the opportunity to make contact with a customer. And it's often the most under-resourced part of the business that many people across the business have no idea what happens in customer service. They've never walked into the contact center. And so even as we bring in these new technologies that might cut some employees out of the equation or change the work, that change management, coaching, and leadership is still a big piece. Also, the research, one last tip is that if it research shows if you train your agents in groups with AI, they, the AI, the, you're going to have more success rather than just training them alone because then they have this support group of other agents too, and they don't feel so alone. Yeah, that's important, especially these days, if they're working from home or if they have a hybrid role, 
the more that they can collaborate to success, as you said, the more likely they are to be successful and mm-hmm. to be in that more positive, supportive environment. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. So uh, one of your laws recommends that CX leaders also become futurists. Now, thinking about what we talked about earlier about trying to balance short-term and long-term CX strategy, similarly, it must be hard for CX leaders to deal with their day-to-day pressures while also looking forward. So Mm -hmm. as a futurist yourself, First of all, why is it so important that CX leaders continue to look forward? And also, you know, what will it take for them to be able to add futurists to their role? I want everyone watching to be a customer experience futurist just like me. In the book, I have some frameworks and I talk about horizon scanning to really understand what are potential scenarios of what could happen Um, On my own podcast, The Modern Customer, one of the things I always talk to leaders about is their routine. And a lot of them in the morning, the first thing they do when they wake up is they literally just read for an hour. And I think that being a student and being curious has never been more important than it is now because things are changing so quickly with technology, with AI, with generational trends that we all have to be students and we can't just be very fixated on how we've always done things and what we've measured in the past because often we have to have a completely different lens for how we see the world. So if you want to be a customer experience futurist, that means you have to get out of your office and see how behavior is changing, how is shopping behavior changing, how is regulation changing, um, where is society headed, How are people shopping? What do they need? Because that commitment to the reality of the modern customer's life, not what you think they need, but what they actually need and what they're actually saying about your products and services, this is really key. It's like we talked about David Cody, his Honeywell turnaround. One of the things he said he would ask customers because he did his own calls was there were two things. He would say, what are we doing great and what could we be doing better? I mean, this is not rocket science. This is just a commitment ongoing to the feedback loop, to studying, to being curious, to looking at the data, and also a commitment to the qualitative data where we're out in the contact center, in the stores, in the hospitals to really understand what's actually happening, not what we say is happening. Yeah. Yeah. They've got to get out uh, out of the office and, and into the field, so to speak. Absolutely. So um, also, as a CX futurist, what is on the horizon that CX leaders should be paying attention to right now? Well, the contact center and customer service is set to be completely disrupted by AI. They say that in the future, we can have fully automated contact centers. That's not happening now, but it could happen. There are many industries where the human is still very much appreciated And in industries where there's just a lot of nuance, like taxes, for example, or healthcare, uh, customers don't necessarily want an AI solving these issues. So it's really important to understand what customers are comfortable with as far as interacting with an AI and what they're not comfortable with. I know that if you cut costs to your contact center with AI, you're going to be very excited. However, Research shows that people want a more human experience in the future, not more technology. So how can you redeploy your people to add value to customers' lives? Uh, Maybe that's continuous training or education around the products and services or added personalization or anticipating customers' future needs. So I think it's important. You can be excited about the cost savings you're going to have with a more automated customer service offering with AI once the technology is better, but not creating a full, a fully technology loaded customer experience. Because again, people are your greatest asset. Don't believe me, go to Trader Joe's. Here's a company that has no technology, no app, no loyalty program, but you feel pretty darn good when you leave that store. And just because you can, doesn't mean you should. So be very thoughtful about the experience that you're offering to customers and don't just uh, be so excited about this AI that you're you're just tossing it up before it's really ready and without understanding how it impacts the experience your customer has of your brand. 
Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thinking about agents, uh, thinking about AI more as a co-pilot for your for your customers, for your agents, for your super supervisors, um, and really making it weaving it in versus um, thinking about how you can rip other things out. You know, right? Absolutely. Well, Blake, thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise and insight with us today. It was so great getting to chat with you about customer experience and see you again in, in person-ish. This has been a while. So thank you again. So good to see you, Ginger. Always nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so for everyone else here, thank you for joining us. Um, if you want more on today's topic, of course, grab Blake's book because it's fantastic. As I said, I've been reading through it. And um, also scan this QR code or click the link that's in the comments to check out our report, uh, Generational Dynamics and the Experience Economy. Uh, actually, you know, and Blake just happened to mention generational dynamics. So, so thanks, Blake, because perfect transition. The report talks about customers and employees changing expectations and how they're influencing each other, and it provides advice for CX leaders on actions that they can take. Also, be sure to follow Genesis on LinkedIn to get notified about courses, the next CX Green Room, because we would love to have you back with us. Uh, new content and more, and of course, sign up for our biweekly newsletter. Um, please like and share today's show, and we will see you next time in the CX Green Room.